All right, line R1, we're in learning task four, where we're gonna take a look at ballast of our HID luminaire. So we've talked about the bulbs for our three main classes already, the high pressure sodium, the mercury vapor, and the metal halide. Of those, the two that are still commonly in use are gonna be my high pressure sodium and my metal halide. The mercury vapor, not so much so, and it was a lower voltage, older type of bulb. So what we're gonna see is gonna be a lot more of our higher voltage ballast these days rather than the low ones. The purpose of the ballast is going to be twofold. Every single time that we have one of these, it is going to be to give us our striking voltage, whether that's going to be a higher amount of voltage or whether that's going to be a lower amount of voltage. And then it is also going to go and maintain the current. What we're going to do is we are going to go and um, regulate the current as it's called. So we'll just put that in there. And we do this just through the fact that the ballast is going to be a form of inductor. It's going to go and choke down the amount of current that we are going to go and travel through. The striking voltage, sometimes we are going to be looking at increasing the striking voltage. If, I, if we're coming in at, say, like 120 volts, you know, we might need to be bumping that up in order to go and strike an arc across our lamp. At other times, that same ballast and same fixture might be used on a higher value of voltage, 347, for example, and at that point, we would be actually dropping the open circuit or the striking voltage that we would have across the lamp as well. So what we're doing is we're just trying to go and maintain striking values of voltage off of it, not necessarily boost it, although in most cases, it will be a boost that we're looking at. Let's go through and uh, just talk about the individual ballasts themselves. Now, every ballast that's out there is going to be the same as a transformer in that it is going to be wound around a core that's going to be made out of laminated steel. And we've got the laminations in there for the same reasons as inside of a transformer. We want to go and maintain the flux lines. We want to go and reduce the eddy currents. And we want to reduce the rest of our shred losses that are going to be inside of it. So we build the same type of cores. Our windings are going to be built in the same way as well. They're going to be varnished magnet wire that we're going to go and place in there. They call it magnet wire because we use it to make magnets, not because it's actually ferromagnetic. Uh, but it's going to go and have a thin coating of varnish that's going to be on there. Once again, this is going to be an oil-based product, which means it is going to be sensitive to temperature. As soon as you go and heat these ballasts up too much, either by putting them in too high of an ambient or uh, by running too much current through them, you look at evaporating all of those VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, out of your insulation, which leads to insulation failure. So just be careful with the temperatures that you're going to place them in. Particularly where this becomes a area of concern is gonna be inside of dusty types of areas. Uh, if you have got any sort of experience working around a lot of my, uh, I'm just gonna move that one down there. So I can draw one in here, but what we refer to as our low bay and our high bay types of fixtures, they're oftentimes going to have a can that's hanging down, and then right above there, there's going to be a big aluminum box. Uh, the reason that it's aluminum is A, for lightness in a lot of cases, but also because aluminum is a really great heat sink, and then your balance is going to be bolts inside of that, and then usually what we will see on a lot of them is there's going to be a set of fins that are going to be off of there. The fins are going to go and increase the surface area of the aluminum casing, which means that we can more effectively dissipate that heat out towards our outside area. Where this becomes a problem is in dusty areas, you start to get buildup of dust, light fluffy dust, which acts the same as a light fluffy, you know, down jacket or something like that. It acts as an insulation and it can really keep your heat inside of your fixtures. For all your fixtures that are going to be, you know, HID, type of fixtures, as well as for a lot of your LED fixtures, they are based upon the idea that these things are going to be kept clean. As soon as you allow dust to build up, if you place them into an area where you know there's going to be a lot of dust, you need to be warning your consumer, whoever you're going to be leaving that, turning that insulation over to, that they need to be cleaning those things regularly or else they're going to end up cooking them off. I mean, if they're fine with, you know, paying you to come in and replace these fixtures every couple of years, that's fine as well. Let them do that. But it's going to lead to burnout because we insulate the actual ballast casing by having that layer of dust that's going to be on top of them. All right, let's talk about the first type of ballast that we have, uh, which is going to be our reactor ballast. Remember what an inductor is? We call an inductor a reactor or a choke. Basically, this is what a simple inductor would do, which is going to be that it's going to limit current. If you take a look inside of this lamp, we know that we are going to go and have an arc that's going to get struck across the arc tube. So I'm just going to go and draw that through here. There's my arc coming back and through like that. 
And when we take a look at that, we see that that is going to be my path for current. So wherever my current is entering in, it's AC, so it's gonna be switching back and forth, I'm gonna be sending current through here. How much resistance does that arc have? Well, it does not have a lot of resistance. Once we ionize, we create a conductor, which means that there's next to no resistance across that ionized path while the path is in action, which would mean that we would need to go and drop the rest of our voltage someplace else. That's where we go and place one of these in there, an inductor. That inductor that we are going to place inside of there is going to go and limit, or it's going to go and choke down the amount of current that I'm going to have inside of here. It will do that through the process of building its counter EMF, CEMF. We've talked about this numerous times this year, and it is going to oppose whatever my source voltage is. Let's say that the source voltage was 120 volts over here. That 120 volts, we might be dropping maybe, you know, five to 10 volts that is gonna be over top of the arc that's happening inside of the lamp. And then we're going to be dropping the remaining 115, 110, whatever that's going to be, over top of this reactants over here. 115 volts, something like that. This is the purpose of a reactor, is just to go and regulate the current. The OCV, the striking voltage, is actually provided by the line in this case. So a reactor balance is in place anytime that the circuit voltage is going to be high enough to strike that across the line itself. As a result of that, these values that are in here that I have 120 volts and you know 208 volt oftentimes aren't going to be sufficient to light. Some small, like those really, really small little 70 watt high pressure sodiums can be lit off of them. But if we're talking about one of those big bulbs, you know, the 400s and the 1000 watts and stuff, you're going to have to have a much higher value of voltage. You're usually going to be looking at, you know, your 277 or your 347 volt classes that you are going to utilize for those in order to get that strike across there and then after that to limit this down. They are going to go and have a crap power factor if we do not correct it because we're going to have just resistance, a little bit of resistance and we saw a small amount of volts dropped over top of there and then a large amount of volts dropped over top of a almost purely inductive component. So to have a really low power factor if we want what we can do then is we can correct that power factor. That's what this is doing over here where we are going to go and have that cap that we place across this at this point, we are going to go and have current that is going to, when we first initially uh, start this up, same as what we've talked about before, anytime there's a cap and an inductor and a power factor corrected system, there's always just a brief instant of inrush once we go and close in. So we're gonna have whoosh, a whole pile of current that's gonna flood in. We're gonna fill the plates of our cap over here. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We drive some away over there. And then what happens is this over here, the inductor is going to try to maintain the value of current while this is going to go and try to maintain the value of voltage. And so while one is going up, the other is going down. And we've talked about that all the way through that, you know, early section of this year, um, yeah, going back about nine weeks now for you, right? But uh, you should remember that they feed their current back and forth. So what happens is we're going to go and get this current that is going to be going back and forth through the lamp from one side of the cap to the other and it's going to be helped or it's going to be aided by the expanding and collapsing fields around here. It's just a power factor corrected type of ballast. That being said, the fact that they are power factor corrected does mean that there is a small amount of inrush that is going to happen the very first time that you spark these things up. So if you've got a bunch of them on a circuit, you can expect to get inrush when you first close in that switch. This is one of those reasons why when we were looking at our current ratings, we had to go to, remember, double the current rating on our contactors and on our switches for discharge lighting because most of our discharge lighting is going to be power factor corrected. And for that brief second, you know, we're running large amounts of current into it. All right, that's my reactor where the primary purpose of the reactor is to go and limit the amount of current. Otherwise, we'd have this thing acting like a short circuit. And then when we stick the cap on, that is there to go and power factor correct it. Let's talk about our next one, which is going to be our auto transformer ballast. Sometimes they're called a lag auto transformer ballast. That's fine. They can call them that as well. But what it is going to be is our standard auto transformer where we are going to be sharing some turns and then we are going to go and up the amount of voltage that we are going to have applied across here. Now, a couple of things that I want to go and uh, look at off of this one. First of all, this one over here, whatever my line is coming in here, I'm going to go and have the ability to have multiple taps coming off of it. 
let's say that this lamp over here needs to have a voltage value of, we're gonna call this thing 500 volts OCB in order to go and strike across from electrode to electrode inside of there. So what I'll do is I'll have these auto transformers, and I don't know if you remember auto transformers, we could have these multi-tap auto transformers. This is really where a lot of our multi-tap auto transformers are coming off of is stuff like this, and where we are going to go and have a number of different leads that are going to come off of here. What we will see is we will see one that is going to go and have N or neutral, or it's gonna be white, identified as white, as we know for code, that's how we identify neutral. And then we're gonna have three others. This is what we refer to as a tri-tap ballast, okay? If you order a tri-tap ballast, it's gonna come with these voltages, 120, 277, and 347 volts that we are going to go and have for each of those individual ratings that we are going to go and have. Um, what is common about all three of these voltages? These are all line to neutral values of voltage, every single one of them. You haven't covered three phase theory yet, but line to neutral means that I'm measuring from a neutral point on my, uh, on my system over to an actual line. The 347 comes out of what we would refer to as a 600, 347. Once again, high voltage first, low voltage second, which indicates that this is going to be a three-phase type of system. It's a Y type of three-phase system. You'll cover them in depth later on, but this is always going to be my line-to-line -line voltage. This is going to be my line-to-neutral voltage. The other one that we are going to go and have is going to be a 480 slash 277. And once again, this is going to be a Y type of voltage, and it's going to be a three-phase type of voltage. Once again, the higher one is line to line, the lower one is going to be line to neutral. And then we've also got this other one that's gonna be a 208 slash 120. Now, if I say 208 slash 120, we're talking about a Y type of three phase system. We've got a single phase type of system that is gonna be my 120 to 40. And we see that then we're going low to high, which indicates that once again, this is gonna be a single phase type over here. So it's, I'm just gonna put that down as one phase. Any one of these, whether it's gonna be inside of the three phase system that 120 volts, or whether it's gonna be inside of my single phase system, that 120 volts is always gonna be associated with a neutral. Why is this important to us? Well, because of this screw shell that we are going to have attached. Now I know that this one over here is drawn a little bit wonky. What they should have is that this lead over here should be going to the screw shell, and this lead over here should be the one going down to the base itself. But you'll just have to bear with the fact that, you know, there's a small mistake in the binders again. But uh, what it's showing us is that we have got a neutral connection and that we need to have out of code a neutral connection to all of our screw shells. So that when people are screwing lamps in and out that they don't accidentally, you know, hit themselves with a line value of voltage. You should always be safe to touch the neutral unless your system is under some sort of a fault. So our tri-tap ballasts are always going to go and utilize my values that are going to be individual line to neutral. Where this thing kind of becomes a bit of a problem is on this 277 volts because some people say, yeah, close enough, 277 volts, 240 volts, I could probably stick 240 volts on there and it's gonna go and operate there's a very good chance that it is going to go and operate. It'll be a little bit dim because your volts per turn are gonna be a slight bit down, but you are going to go and expose yourself and anybody else to danger off that screw shell. And if that screw shell inside of the actual fixture is bonded to ground, you're just gonna be tripping your breaker all the time. All right, so that's my tri-tap balance with my individual values of voltage. We'll just remove all of that so we have that clean working space here again. Uh, my auto transformer balance, now that we've establish what those taps are there for, we're going to go and have a slightly larger voltage than what we generally speaking are bringing in. That's going to be giving me my open circuit voltage that I'm going to have. Now this one over here, same deal as what we would have had before, we are going to go and utilize this section over here to go and be a drop in voltage that I am going to go and use to make sure that I don't have too much current that is going to be going through here. So whatever I've got over here, if this was 120 volts, this section of the line would be making up the difference. So 380 volts across that span from there to there, that would be made up to, in order to go and get me 120 plus a boost of 380 gets me up to that 500 volts that I will have over there. 
Uh, that 380 volts, I'm going to be dropping that all over top of these ones over here through the current that goes through. Once again, it's going to be poor power factor that we are going to go and have. We will have better power factor if we go to something like this. Now, there's a couple of things that are happening inside of here. First of all, this one over here has got a series reactor that has been brought into this one as well. Secondly, the drawing is screwed for some reason. I don't know why it's been you know, moved to where it is right now inside of here, but what we should have inside of this one is that this line is going all the way up to over here. We would never place a little extra winding up here for you know, no sake whatsoever. That's just a, it's a poorly drawn one over there. So I'm just gonna draw it out over here on mine. You can correct it inside of your books, but that's what it should look like. It's essentially, and I'll just remove everything off of this one. It is essentially the same as what we had on this one over here, just with the addition of a couple of components. We've got that added in, which is gonna be a series reactor, which is going to go and limit my current even more. And we have got this added in, which is going to be my capacitor. Now they've got it drawn across from here to here, which looks a little bit confusing, but they could have just as easily drawn it across from there down to there. Exact same thing. What they're trying to show is that they've got this thing attached to the line so that once again, my power factor correction capacitor is going to go and take care of any of my inductive bars that I'm going to have, right? Those things are going to be able to go and have just a play date with each other. They pass the inductive bars back and forth and my actual system itself does not get bothered by it. So correct that one inside of your book there. Once again, purpose of this section over here, limit current. Purpose of this correct PF. And then the purpose of the extra windings over here, boost my voltage. And this one could be the same as the other one that it could be a tri-tap type of ballast. The cap is always gonna go directly across the lamp connection that we are going to go and see. Uh, because that cap being placed all the way across the lamp connection is always gonna be at the same voltage. If I would place it across the 120, 277, or 347 volt leads, then it would not work for everything else. You know, the different values of voltage would go and give us different bars. We covered that, you know, in depth inside of our early areas of topic this year. So we always make sure that it's placed out here because that way, whatever I'm feeding in, whichever tap it's going to go and be, it is always gonna be the same value of voltage that it's seeing across from one side over to the other on the lamp circuit. It is a larger and more expensive ballast than what this one would have been. There's more windings that are gonna be with this one. We did use these ones with mercury. We also do use these ones with my metal halide as well. Remember that the mercury and the metal halide in a lot of ways are very, very similar in the way that they are going to go and operate. Okay, let's move over onto our next one that we are going to go and have, which is gonna be my auto regulator ballast. Now there's a difference between this one and the previous in the where I have got this connected over here. What do we have over here? It is going to go and be a series connection. So what do I have inside of here? I've got L, I have got C capacitance, so L for inducted, C for capacitance, and I'm going to go and have the actual arc gap, which is going to go and have a form of resistance. What I have is I have got a series RLC circuit. I don't know if you remember looking at series RLC circuits and tuning stuff towards resonance, but you know that we can go and tune stuff towards resonance and we can get ridiculously high values of voltage that we will be able to go and see across my individual reactive currents, right? They'll cancel each other out, but we're able to boost up to larger values of voltage across those components. So we have to be careful with those ones. We did also say that what we will do with a RLC series circuit is we will usually only ever see them inside of equipment. You'll note that this is a dotted line showing us that this is gonna be inside of equipment. I've got two leads coming off this ballast here and here that go to the lamp, I've got two leads coming off this ballast here and here that are going to go out towards my supply. Once again, this one could be tri-tapped, okay? I could have 277 and a 347 volt lead that are going to go and come out of it as well, uh, or it could be just a single voltage based upon the installation that you are buying for. If you're doing a massive warehousing complex, you're not necessarily gonna buy tri-tap ballast because everything in there is going to be at the same voltage. So you can just buy, you know, the simple one that doesn't have the extra taps bought out. And if you're buying in bulk, it's gonna be cheaper that way. 
So two wire ballots do exist as well. Um, these are sometimes referred to as CWA ones, constant wattage ones, because what we're going to have is we're going to have maintenance of our voltage that's going to be provided by our capacitor. Remember, a capacitor opposes any sort of a change in voltage. What it's going to do is not only power factor correct, but it's also going to go and store electrons on its plates. The electrons are always going to be moving back and forth, and we get that. But it's going to go store charge inside there that it's going to be able to maintain whenever my voltage drops. It is going to go and no longer be able to hold electrons as effectively on its plate, which means that those electrons are going to go and rush through my lamp circuit. Back to the other side, right? They're always trying to get from one side over to the other, which means that I'm going to maintain the amount of current that is going to go through here. This gives us a constant amount of light. We don't have to worry about brownouts as much with these type over here. The previous ones that we looked at, this one over here, my auto transformer that I had, we were limited to supply voltage variations of 5%. We could go up to 105, we could go and drop down from 105 down to you know, 95 as well. And that was gonna be fine. Uh, it was, wasn't great for it, and I could have instantaneous short amounts of dips that would go as far as you know, 15 or 20%. But if you're in an unstable voltage area, or if you're in an industrial application, where you've got large motors that start up and sometimes brown out your actual system that you have on there, you wouldn't want to use one of these because in doing so, uh, you're going to have your lights that are going to go and turn off and then you got to wait for these things to go and restrike. So these ones over here, my auto regulator, are going to be much, much better. We can handle much bigger dips because we have got now stored charge in two separate areas inside of our circuit that are in series with the lamp. Note that the current through this series regulator and through this cap are always going to have to rush through the lamp. So whenever there's a change in current or a change in voltage, these two are going to react. This is why we call them reactive components. They're going to react and they're going to try to oppose those changes, which is really going to keep us at a constant wattage on this lamp itself. This is different than the way that this cap is set up inside of here. This cap is all about power factor correction. If you take a look, at the current route that's inside of here, I'm just gonna erase a bunch of the extra things inside of here so we can see it a little clearer. If you take a look at the current loop that's inside of here, you see that the current that is gonna be going back and forth between my cap and my inductor follows that route over there. It does not enter and go through the lamp itself, which is why we can you know, get those dips and we get the extinguishing of the arc. This is really good for my power factor correction, not so good for my lamp itself. Moving to this one over here, and once again, I'll just erase a few more and we'll just reiterate this one more time. Anytime that my cap or my inductor are sending current back and forth, it is always traveling through the lamp, which is going to go and maintain the amount of wattage off of it. This is gonna be more common inside of our metal halide. We did have the other ones over here. Uh, the auto transformers that we started with our Merc Vape. We can run metal halides off of our auto transformers. So if it's an old fixture, you might be running one of these auto transformer types inside. If it's a new fixture, you're probably going to be running one of these auto regulators inside of here. All right, this one is fun the regulator ballast. What's different about this one and the other one? Well, you see that it's done with an isolation transformer. The other ones were done with auto transformers where we had direct connection. And we'll take a look at that, the auto regulator ballast over here. We had a direct connection from this line going up through here. We could actually, you know, ohm this whole thing through. This one, we are now going to be dealing with two separate windings, which means that those two separate windings are going to be, as we talked about numerous times inside of transformers, acting as if they were individual inductors. Yes, they're bound together by mutual induction. They have to be, but they are going to go and act as inductors, which means they're going to oppose dirty voltage, you know, spikes that are coming through and stuff like that. So any sort of spike, if I got a big nasty coming through on this side over here, this thing is going to go and attenuate it into a smaller nasty. And by the time that it makes it through here and out, it's going to be into a way smaller nasty. Disturbances, whether they're going to be voltage peaks or voltage drops, it does the same thing, makes that into a smaller one, makes that into a smaller one, are going to go and be attenuated out of there out of there so we don't have as much brownouts that's going to go and happen inside of these ones. It is similar but superior because we've got more reactants inside there. Once again inside of here 
our current pathway is going to be a series RLC circuit through my lamp and back and forth like that, which means that we're going to go and have that same CWA characteristic, the constant, constant wattage auto transformer that we're going to have. We can take in massive dips because we've got stored energy in the magnetic field of this transformer as well as in the electrostatic field of this capacitor over here and so they can give us carry through so if i've got you know just a janky electrical system with big motors coming on and offline all the time these are great inside of those situations and there is another place that these are also utilized and this one is going to be difficult for you to go and maybe visualize at first but it is going to be utilized inside of series lighting situations okay series circuits is not something that we do commonly. There's a few places that we will do it. I know you might have seen it on like some little LED under cabinet lights before. That's the most common place most electricians have run into it. But in the big picture out there, there's really two places that we have series lighting. They're going to be in street lighting and they are going to go and be inside of my airport runway light. Both of those are things that you are going to cover more in depth as you hit your fourth year. But we're going to talk about them now because they use these types of balance inside of them. Series lighting circuits are going to go and have what we call constant current circuits, where we are going to go and have a supply and we're going to send it out at a super high value of voltage because we know that anytime that I've got resistances in series, they're going to go and drop an equivalent amount of voltage across each one. So I can go and split up, I can send out a massive amount of voltage, ridiculously high value of voltage to a whole pile of loads and I can split it down equally if the loads are equal onto an equal amount. This is handy because if I'm going to do street lighting, think about like a bridge, you know, if you travel over top of the Portman Bridge or you go over top of the Agassiz Rosedale Bridge or something like that, we have got massive long distances and we need to have lots of light on there so that people don't drive off into the rivers and stuff so we want to have those well lit and what we have is this just give me a second i'm just going to draw out no more than four of these because past that it's just too much drawing and you get the idea with this over here we are going to go and have individual ballasts that are going to be series connected over here like that and i'm just going to go and draw this as a simple lamp because complex lamps are too complex for a simple man like me. And we'll stick that in there, ooh, ooh, like that, okay? And we're gonna do the same on a whole pile of these. All of these are going to be done the exact same way. And that one, I keep drawing that one backwards. That one, I know, I know, just hang tight. You can maybe fast forward this so you see the drawings all done because I'm not gonna be talking about anything while I'm trying, struggling actually to go and draw all these. But you need to know about these, so let's talk. All right, that's what we are going to go and have. Now these lights, these actual light standards are gonna be hundreds of meters apart. You've driven down freeways before and you've seen these things. Um, <clears throat> These are going to be hundreds of meters apart, so we're going to go and have a high value of voltage over here. Let's say that this value of voltage that I'm going to be placing out on these is going to go and be 12 kV. That's 12,000 volts that I'm going to have. That would mean that the 12,000 volts is going to go and be dropped equally across each of these, which is going to be a 3,000 volt winding then that I'm going to have over here. 3,000, well, let's call it 3K. 3K, 3K, and 3K and 3K over there. How many components are there inside of here to really burn out? Well, if we build good quality windings, there's really not a lot that could actually go and burn out out of these, right? When you look at these, it's just coils of wire. There's no moving parts, there's no switching, there's nothing like that. We're just taking 12,000 volts, feeding it across there. Here's my individual lights that I'm going to go and have out there. Now, my lights are able to pick up their value of voltage based on volts per turn, like in any other transformer, and it's this same circuit that we're going to have over here. We've got a cap, we're going to go and have a light bulb, and we're going to go and send that through that. It's going to be HID, not an incandescent inside of here. The beautiful thing about these as well is that if I lose a single light, let's say that that light bulb gets taken out, okay? Somebody just 
crashed the car into that post over there, took out half the light and the wiring and stuff. These little transformers are usually going to be buried underground where they're safe from jankery. And usually they're going to go and have as well a little fuse that's going to be inside of both of the lines over here on this side over here. We don't fuse this side because we want to keep this side over here operating, but we'll fuse this side so that if there's a fault, if this light goes out, you'll note that it does not interrupt the current that is going to go and flow through my actual series lighting circuit over here. These other ones over here are still going to be able to be maintained. So taking out a single one of these does not take out the entire system. But what I'm able to do now is operate at a really high value of voltage and just maintain a constant amount of current out and through this over here. That value of voltage is going to go and be variable as well, because if I lose this, I lose my watts that I would have off of that as well. And we know that VA in is equal to VA out. And really, this is like one big giant transformer with many windings off of it. So if I'm no longer putting out these watts, I'm no longer going to be putting out these watts over here on my, on my input over here. We maintain the same value of current because the current is going to give us flux. We know that phi is equal to ampere turns. Right? So we need to have the same amount of current through these at all times so that we maintain the proper amount of flux, so that we maintain the proper amount of voltage on the secondaries of each of these. But my primary side is going to go and change its value of voltage based upon how many of these are going to be lit at any given time. All right? It's a very common thing. Series lighting inside of my roadway lighting ever take a look at any uh, airport runway thing, and you don't do that without being properly certified for it, but if you look at anything to do with uh, roadway lighting, series lighting is always gonna be done like this. Cool, all right. Let's move on then to our next ones. High pressure sodium. High pressure sodium was that bulb that had the long uh, alumina bore silicate tube inside of it that was going to give us that yellowish white light, that tube needs to have a high amount of starting voltage inside of it. So what it's going to have, it is going to have a starting aid inside of here. Usually you see them as little like black boxes. They're gonna be epoxy potted, which means that all the electronics inside of there are just gonna be soaked in epoxy because it keeps all the weather out, right? We are going to go and have whatever our volts are coming in. Our volts coming in could be higher, they could be lower. It's really going to depend upon what we're running this lamp at itself. Once we ionize the air inside of here, it doesn't take a lot to go and run the actual arc through that tube. So in a lot of cases, we will actually step down inside of this section. Your tri-tap could be looking at something like that, you know, 347, 277, and 120 off of that one. Common down over here. That is supposed to go to the screw shell. I know they've got them always tied to the base contact, but whatever, we can live with that. And then I'm going to go and have a secondary circuit that's going to go through here. Now, if I don't have an arc through here, how much current would be running through here? Well, if there's no arc, there's no current. That's how we carry current through a light bulb. So if I've got no current that is going to be traveling through here, through these windings in particular over here, those windings are going to go and have a small amount of resistance to them, right? They have to. They're made out of copper. So if I have got... I and R over here, that is going to go and give me voltage. If there would be current going through here, there would be potential voltage between here and here. And if I've got potential voltage in across here, that's what's gonna go and shut off this starting aid. What this starting aid does is it's always monitoring. Inside of there, there's a small little circuit that is acting as a very simple voltmeter. And it's just monitoring what's going on across these two lines over here. If this lamp is out right now, that would mean that this would have no current that would be flowing through here. And if there would be no current that would be flowing through there, that would mean that there would be no voltage that's across it. So that's how it knows that the lamp is out. If the lamp is out, what that is going to allow it to do is it is going to go and pick up voltage. Note how it's going across from this side here. We'll call this one my line side and this side, which is my neutral side. So we've got a neutral and we've got a line side over here. We are going to go and pick up the voltage. We're going to go and convert it to DC inside of these. Okay, in most cases, it's gonna go into DC. And then what we're able to do is we're able to go and run that DC through an inductor and then using semiconductor components inside there, open and close it really, really quickly. This should 
in your mind at this point, triggered that idea of the ignition coil. All the way back in, I think, the A1 line when we were looking at inductors, we talked about inductive kick and the dangers of inductive kick and the usefulness as well. And we said that the big place that we use inductive DC kick is going to be in ignition systems. We use it for ignition systems for gas. DSI, direct spark ignition, that would be inside of a furnace, uses that. We use it for ignition systems inside of light bulbs as well, where we are going to go and just cause that current flow to go and happen. So what happens inside of here is that this thing is going to go and put out volts here and volts here. Yes, they interface with the rest of this, and it does cause a little bit of flicker and strain, but you gotta remember, where does that current want to go? Does it wanna go out here, that DC current? Absolutely not. It wants to go back to the place that it was separated from. So whatever I place inside of here, this DC starting circuit is going to go and have current that's going to be delivered and it is going to try to make its way through the path of least resistance back to the other side. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm dying here. <coughs> path of least... <coughs> the path of least resistance is going to be going through that bulb over there. So that starting aid is going to go and fire a repetitive DC, brrr, like that, at it, and then it's going to go and ignite that arc. As soon as it ignites that arc, all of a sudden, it can read that it's got this value of voltage that's coming out. By the way, I should have drawn this coming out from that lead over there, because that's actually where it emits from. It has to emit from this one over here. That's why you have to follow the connection diagrams on these ones. It emits from that one, and then only once we actually get current flow established, once we establish that current flow, that means that there's now a conductor across here. Ionizing the gas creates a conductor across there, which means that my AC can be like whoosh, 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 back out like that. So my AC path will then be able to establish through there, which it gives me that volt drop across there, which tells us thing, yep, yeah, you got to start it, shut it off. And at that point, we're going to go and shut down the ignition coil itself. It is a high voltage, uh, continuous DC igniter. Coll convert to DC, and then we just have this collapsing field. It is designed to go and require that. Now, you should hopefully in first year have talked a little bit about the benefits of AC compared to DC. And one of the things that AC does really well is it travels long distances. DC sucks at traveling long distances. This is one of the big reasons why AC won. We could convert it and we could go and travel at long distances. This means that if I have got my ballast over here and I've got my lamp located someplace else, that I'm going to go and have to have to have to have to make sure that I do not drop all that DC voltage. If you do a remote ballast mounting, we talked about this in one of the previous learning uh, tasks. If you remote ballast mount one of these high pressure sodium lights, you need to upsize the gauge of wire going out to these. The manufacturer, first of all, is going to go and have charts for that because you're not taking a part of picture. You know, that would ruin the CSA on it. It's no longer a certified piece of equipment. You can't do that. But if you had one that had a remote, you know, ballast and lamps, you would then go and follow the manufacturer's guidelines for the voltage rating because it's going to be high voltage DC. So you're probably going to be using like a uh, silicone type of conductor inside of there. And you're also going to have to go and follow their gauging rating based upon the distance away. Just be very careful with it. That starting aid is also going to be operating in the kilovolts, 2,500 to 4,000 volts. Some of them go actually a little bit higher than that. I think our peak for about the 1,000 watt uh, high pressure sodium sits around 6,000 volts that we are going to go and have. Short amount of time, it's going to go and happen for, but it's still going to cause you know, a phenomenal amount of damage if you happen to interrupt that pass. pass. So be very, very careful with that. If towards the end of the life of this lamp, that my arc itself that's inside of here starts to go and change its characteristics, and it will, because we're going to have consumables inside of there that are going to get, you know, changed and converted and, you know, bonded down and stuff through all the current that's uh, traveling through there. What we are going to go and have is that we're going to have a drop in current flow that's going through here. They talk about that the arc voltage may come become too high for the ballast to provide stable operation. It's actually not the arc voltage that's becoming too high. It is the arc current that is becoming too low. And what happens is that that arc current becomes too low, this voltage inside of here is going to be trying to interrupt and refire this thing, you know, repetitive times. You're going to go and get the cycling of your lamp where the arc, volt, our arc current is going to go and get too low. It is going to extinguish itself and then this thing is going to go and pick up because it doesn't see voltage anymore and it's going to go and restrike. We call this cycling. Uh, not 
a long restrike time, so oftentimes consumers will just leave it. They'll be like, oh yeah, sometimes the yard light turns out for a minute, but then it comes back on, so that's fine. It's just not good for this over here. This is designed for infrequent utilization. You'll burn it out if you've got a cycling lamp. Just replace that lamp at that point. It should be good to go. All right, let's talk about polarization of the lamp holder. Uh, for some reason here at the very end, now they get to this you know, thing where, hey, maybe we should talk about the polarization change where the leads are going to be. Um, polarization of the lamp holder is required out of a Canadian electrical code. Go to section 30, look it up, find it. It's in there. I've seen it numerous times. You should be able to find it in a couple of minutes as well. And it talks about that my screw shell of my lamp holders must, 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 must be tied to my grounded circuit conductor, also commonly known as my neutral that I'm going to go and have. So over here, this thing is done correctly. We see that the neutral is connected over to the screw shell. And then I see that I've got my line, which is going to be connected over through here and up to there. What is this type of balance? You should be able to identify this type of balance. If you can't identify it, just looking at the picture, go back through, make sure you can identify your types of balance. Yeah. I'll leave that one with you. You should be able to sort that one out. In cases where we have got auto transformers like this, we're going to have to have a direct connection through. In some cases, we're going to go and have isolation types of transformers. Once again, these are going to be ones that are going to be better suited to massive dips because we've got more inductors in there, which are going to be able to go and, you know, collapse some of their magnetic fields to supply that lacking current. So we like these things on disruptive type of systems, as well as we like this one on our series lighting applications, right? Because we can series out another couple of these and all of my current would only be traveling through that primary winding that I would have off of it. Uh, when we do have those series connections, we are going to have to go and ground down one side of the secondary circuit. If you take a look at the secondary circuit as is, I'll just remove that, you'll see that there's no point that is connected over to ground. Absolutely nothing connected to ground. We can pick any point inside of our circuit to go and ground down. So if we pick a point, we're going to pick a point that's going to be attached to this. Now, this is usually done by the manufacturer. It shouldn't be done by you. If you're buying stuff that you know needs you to make these sort of judgment calls on it, whoo, I doubt that that stuff is going to be certified here in Canada. Uh, but this is just, you know, so you know what's actually happening inside of it, right? That's part of the electrician training system is you understanding what the components are, not just blindly hooking them up anymore. So we're going to have to have this thing that's going to be tied down to ground. In some cases, we will have dual lamp types of systems. The dual lamp types of systems are allowable, but they're not it, like our very, very most common types that we are going to have out there. Um, whenever we have got uh, dual lamp systems, if we get a failure on either one of these lamps, we're going to go and lose the entire system. So, you know, having two lamps inside of there is great, but it's all tied off of a single system. So don't expect to see lots of them. In the cases where you do see it though, you are going to go and have one of them that is going to have to be tied down to ground. And then the other one is going to go and be series up from the base contact of the one that has got the screw shell tied down needs to go to this one over here. So that if I were to go and touch this one, if this lamp were to be burnt out inside over there, and if I were to actually touch the screw shell point over here, there would be isolation because if it's burnt out, there's no current that's going to be going through here. Right? That makes sense. You would not be allowed to go and have this thing done in the opposite way. The opposite way would be if I were to just wait that out and wait that out. Uh, the bad way to do it would be if I were to take it like that and then if I were to take it like that. Because at that point, if I were to go and touch the screw shell, I would be touching directly to a ungrounded line over here. Right? You see it's on the opposite side of the transformer winding from where that ground itself actually is. All right, um, last thing that I'm gonna go talk about, just referring back to this one over here, but in ballast in general, oh, sorry, not that one, this one over here, uh, where we were talking about the remote mounting of ballast, I wanna just quickly talk about ballast replacement as well. Anytime that we have got ballasts that need to be replaced, cut out the old wire, remove, remove, old wire okay always 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 remove old wire you have probably gone into some fluorescent fixture at some point in your career open that thing up and there is just like you can tell that things had like five ballast changes 
because there's you know wires cut out and other wires and everybody just kind of morets onto there because it's such a big rat's nest on the inside of there that nobody wants to go and deal with it. There's a problem with that. If you have got for fluorescence, for HIDs, uh, but for any type of lighting, particularly high frequency styles of lighting, and we're gonna talk about some you know induction lighting in a second, but my electronic fluorescent mouse are operating up in the 20,000 Hertz range, super high frequency. Uh, these HIDs are moving towards having some electronic ballast inside of them. LEDs oftentimes going to be operating at fairly high frequencies as well so that we can go and eliminate the amount of flicker that I would have out of them. This is what's happening. If you go to something where we've got feeding in over here, we're going to call that thing 120 volts that we're going to be feeding in at 60 hertz. And we're going to go and feed out of this electronic ballast over here at, we're going to call this thing 20k hertz. Okay, we'll make it a standard fluorescent ballast right now, but it really doesn't matter. If I've got 20k hertz and I've got all this conductor inside of here, and then I finally attach it to my lamp itself, let's draw it in as a bulb over here. What I've actually built over here is going to go and be an air core inductor. Okay, you've got coils of wire. Yeah, it's not all neatly like looped together, but it's all jammed inside of there. That air coil inductor is going to go and have a XL, right? What is XL? XL is equal to two pi FL. My L value is gonna be pretty small for this. But if my L value even goes slightly up with the frequency that we're operating this side at 20K Hertz, 20,000 Hertz over there, we are going to go and see a massive, massive, massive change in my XL because my frequency is so incredibly high. My XL is going to go up. And if my XL goes up, that means that I'm going to have a massive amount of resistance that I'm going to basically see before I ever get out to the lamp itself. That massive amount of resistance is going to go and cut down on the amount of current that we're going to get there. So in a lot of cases, our lamps will not be able to light, or if they do light, they're going to be dim, or they're going to be problematic, or they're going to be browning out and shutting off and restarting and cycling all the time. So if you're taking apart fixtures ever, and you're reballasting, don't be that chump that's just cutting off the wires, moretting the other ones on nice tight to the ballast, and then, you know, just packing more up inside of that fixture. You want minimum amount of wire. A little bit of extra is not, you know, going to kill you. To have a foot or two of extra maximum inside of that fixture, perfectly fine. You don't want to have strain on any of your, you know, tombstones on either end of your fluorescence or on your screw shell contacts for anything that's going to be an Edison base. But if you've got, you know, more than a foot or two of slack in any conductor, Make sure that you're trimming that back before you make up your final connections. You will get erratic operation otherwise. All right, that is the end of my learning task four. Let's take a look at induction lights next.